Let's start by seeing how we can use t-test to actually make tests of the parameters in our regression model. Now remember that the t-statistic has a general form. A t-statistic is simply a sample statistic minus the population parameter if the null hypothesis is true, divided by the estimated standard error of that statistic. So when we had a t-test for a one population mean, it was simply x bar minus the population mean if the null hypothesis were to be true, divided by the estimated standard error. And this formed a t-test, which allowed us to reference the observed value of t against the t-distribution. So let's start with the t-test for beta 1, that is, for the slope in the population. The t-statistic for b1 is simply the observed value of b1, the slope observed in our sample, minus the population value of beta 1 if the null hypothesis is true, divided by the estimated standard error of b1. Let's begin with the value of beta 1 in this formula. Recall that this is the value of beta 1 if the null hypothesis is true. And our null hypotheses always state that there's no effect or no difference from zero. So in essence, we're stating that in the population, if the null hypothesis is true for B1, there is no slope. Let's actually look at this on a diagram. So here again, we have study time and final percentage. And what we're really asserting if the null hypothesis is true is that the regression line in the population could be written as beta zero plus zero times xi plus error. That is, one unit change in x has no effect on the y scores. Now what this would look like is a flat line or a non-sloped line in the population still with error around it. Now error, remember, is always there. Individuals at any given amount of study time will certainly differ from each other. All we're asserting with the null hypothesis being true for beta 1 is that the conditional means of these distributions don't change as a function of x. Now notice that where the intercept here is a different question. I have the intercept drawn to be about 83, but I could also as easily draw it at 0. This would be rather strange for final percentage, but notice that the null hypothesis with respect to beta 1 has nothing to do with the null hypothesis with respect to beta 0. So in our t-test, the value of beta 1 here is actually 0. So the numerator simply has the estimate from our sample. So b1 divided by the standard error of b1. Now, I want to show you the estimated standard error. You don't really need to know this, but I want you to get some insight into how it's formed. Now, notice that the denominator has the sums of squares for x. That is, the sum of square deviations in simply the x variable. Typically, our standard error formulas have n in the denominator. And in fact, the sums of squares are sensitive to how many people we have in our sample. Notice that if we add more people to our sample, we're adding more squares that we're summing up. So the sums of squares for x will get larger when you add more people to it. But it's also sensitive to something else, and that is the spacing of the x variable. So this denominator is a function of the number of observations, but also the spacing of the observations in x. Specifically, how spaced out we have our observations in the x-axis. And notice that the sums of squares for x is in the denominator here. So to the degree that the sums of squares for x are larger, the standard error of our estimate will be lower. That is, we'll get a more precise estimate of beta 1 if we space the observations in the x-axis. Now let me give you a diagram to help you see why this is the case. So here are the spacings we had to start with. So observing people at 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 hours of study. Now imagine we were to space them more closely. That is, we observe them at 5.5, 5.7, 6.2, etc. Now notice what happens here. If I move these means around just a little bit, the slope of this line will move tremendously. So even a slight misestimation of any of these means can move around the slope quite tremendously. So a rather unstable slope. However, if I space them out, so move them back to where they originally were, let me move these means just as much, and notice that the line doesn't move nearly as much. Now this is just the physical reality of this. If you imagine holding a bar and spacing your hands out, small movements in your hand wouldn't actually move the bar very much. But if you hold your hands towards the center of the bar, well then even tiny movements would actually move the bar quite a bit. So our line is behaving in the same way. That is, our estimate for beta 1 is sensitive to how you space those observations.
So if it's critically important that you estimate beta 1 well, you want to space your observations as much as possible. So if possible, measuring somebody at one hours of studying all the way up to a thousand hours. If you space those observations a lot, you will get a more stable estimate of the population slope.